Hi everyone, I'm Donna, editor of the LA Times Book Club, and I'd like to welcome you to our very first virtual meetup. Earlier this month, we had to cancel our monthly event due to the coronavirus outbreak. So we decided to move our community book club to the couch. Thank you all for joining us from home. If you're a mystery lover, you probably know that LA is, has a reputation as the undisputed capital of noir. And tonight, we'll be talking with crime novelists Steph Cha and Joey Day about what a new generation of fictional detectives tell us about our city. Steph Cha is the author of the best-selling 2019 thriller, Your House Will Pay. Her novel explores LA's racial tensions through the stories of two families dealing with a decades-old crime. The setting will be familiar to anyone who lived through the 1992 riots. Joey Day writes the IQ Mysteries, featuring private eye Isaiah Quintabi. He counts Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Michael Conley among his fans. Joe's news, new novel is High Five, book number four in his series set in East Long Beach. Tonight, Steph and Joe will be talking with Times Metro reporter Maria Laganga, who interviewed both authors for a Times story published online today. Maria reads more mysteries than anyone I know. She devoured more than 20 just working on the stories. Welcome, Steph, Joe, and Maria. Uh, glad, to, glad to see you all. How about we raise a glass and share a toast with our readers joining us from home? We all know wine is an essential uh, and beer are essential parts of a book club. Thank you all for joining soda. us. I'd also like to give a shout out to Milo and Duke, Steph's Bassett Hounds. Um, I think they'll be joining us for this evening. And uh, now, who's that? This is Duke. Milo, come here. This is Milo. Welcome, Duke and Milo. You guys are amazing. Well, I'm going to turn things over to Maria, and I'll be rejoining you a little later. Thank you, everyone. Hello, and we're happy to have all of you here tonight. Um, I'm having some serious dog envy. I wish I had a Duke and Milo with me tonight. Um, for our first question, I'd like to talk to both of you, but first Steph probably, about what noir is and why LA. Um, you have talked a little bit, Steph, about how it's kind of an elastic thing. There are a lot of interesting components. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what, how you define noir and why here? Yeah, I mean, I think noir is a very flexible category, um, in large part because I think it's more of a mood than a strict genre. Um, you know, film noir is the, a term that was invented by a French audience to describe <laughs> trends in American cinema. Um, th that came out of kind of the World War One Depression, World War Two era, and it and a lot of these movies were um, pretty hard boiled, had a lot to do with crime, um, but really the defining quality was this dark mood. You know, film noir just means black film, um, and I think that's how I tend to think of noir now as this kind of atmospheric quality. Um, this cynical but like here's a here's a realistic dark way of looking at the state of the world the state of society um it's a mood that i think a lot of people can probably relate to now and it's no one kidding. that has um yeah it, it you know it's kind of that like um we're we're getting into dark territory but it's deeply realistic um in a way that is troubling um you know not very escapist stuff um, although at least uh, most noir is not going to deal with this exact situation, at least what we have no. now. <laughs> no kidding. So why LA? Why is LA so suited and why did it start there? I think a large part of that is um, probably, you know, I think the fact that Raymond Chandler came from LA and wrote about LA and was so definitive to the genre, probably the fact that Hollywood is here too. Um, and also I think just thematically, uh, this whole sunshine and noir um, dichotomy that was defined by uh, Mike Davis in uh, City of Courts, I think that's something that um, makes L.A. a fitting place for it, right? It's the kind of this place of optimism and dreamers where people come to uh, realize great things and are faced with, you know, uh, realities that are a lot starker and darker. Uh, than, and, then, uh, and then crash and burn. Hollywood. Yeah. 
Um, so, Joe, tell me, do you think Isaiah, your wonderful character in the four novels, um, do you think he is a, a protagonist who fits into the noir mode? Yes, um, in the sense, in the same sense as the the fifties noir of Sam Spain, Philip Marlowe. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's one guy in a very dangerous city, um, who in a very dark story who seeks justice or maybe just to survive and along the way uncovers all kinds of things about our city that we, we may not have known. It's, um, I think noir now is, it's really hard to call the noir. It's much more diverse. Um, mm -hmm. The stories have a much wider scope. There are many more themes. Uh, I, for me, like Steph's book, for example, I think it borders, it really is, Another kind of literature. Literature people don't feel that way, but well, I think some I of the best some of the best books who in the mystery genre are are definitely literature. Both of the you know the works that you have done. Um, in fact, Steph, having lived through the riots and helped cover um, some of the things like you know the the Michael Brown and Ferguson, I had to put your book down like three or four times. It was heartbreaking to me. It was very very. Um, Powerful. Um, so, in terms of um, the setting, um, you both, I think that your characters are both good examples of kind of a new generation of heroes that tell us something about Los Angeles that most readers probably don't know or show us a different Los Angeles than the norm. Um, can you tell us, Steph, a little bit about? Um, sort of your house will pay and what it shows us, a Los Angeles, really intimately that we might not know otherwise? You know, I'm attracted to L.A. as subject matter because it is it is so diverse in every sense of the word. I mean, it's a place that is made up of all these different neighborhoods that butt up against each other and that have, you know, a lot of overlap, but also, like, you drive a mile in any direction from where you're sitting right now in front of your computer, and, like, you're going to be in uh, very different places very quickly. Um, and I wanted to write about different pockets about of Los Angeles, um, you know, that would have been affected by... Um, by the aftermath of the 90s uprising um, from then to today. Um, and so I looked at the Korean Valley because that's where I grew up. You know, I am Korean American. I grew up surrounded by Korean Americans doing Korean American things in the Valley and not Koreatown. Um, you know, although I spent a lot of time in Koreatown too. Um, and I, had, I just hadn't seen that pocket explored. And, um, you know, when I thought about the, uh, the Matthews family, the, the black family in my book, mm -hmm. you know, I wanted to kind of depict um, the exurban black experience. Um, and so I ended up writing about Palmdale, which is another place that I hadn't really seen in fiction. And I think like LA offers all of these places and people that go with them and all these communities that I think um, get under, are underexplored in favor of places where um, there are um, more traditional LA stories, you know, things that, things that double up with Hollywood and kind of the images of LA that people are used to, um, you know, and also I would say um, this is a book that uh, is about a major American city that doesn't really feature a lot of white people. Um, well, let's 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 talk a little bit about that because your you explored the life of a Korean American family and a, an African American family, and there was a very particular inspiration for this novel. Can you talk a little bit about where it came from? Yeah, um, this book is um, loosely based on the murder of Latasha Harlins, um, who was a uh, fifteen-year-old girl. Um, who was shot and killed by a uh, shopkeeper in South Central in uh, March 1991, um, you know, on March 16th, the anniversary just passed. Um, and um, the, the girl was black and the shopkeeper was Korean. And um, the shopkeeper, Sun Ja Du, was convicted of voluntary manslaughter. You know, she shot her in the back of the head. It was pretty unambiguous. Um, and then was um, sentenced to no jail time. She got probation, a $500 fine, and community service. And it was an enormous miscarriage of uh, miscarriage of justice, and it was kind of a secondary cause of 
the Rodney King uprising, um, it was pointed to as an example of the devaluation of black lives. And, um, and it also led to the targeting of Korean businesses during the rioting. Um, it was also the culmination of pre-existing tensions in South Central at the time where Koreans owned a lot of the businesses and did not hire from the neighborhoods and there were a lot of cultural misunderstandings and there was just a lot of out and out racism. Um, so let's, and, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, I so just, let's, oh, so I just wanted to write about that. So Joe, let's talk a little bit about South Central because that's where you were raised um, right around San Pedro Street and Adams Boulevard. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience growing up there and how you translated that into the East Long Beach of Isaiah world? A lot of the book has to do with how I grew up, my background. I grew up in South Central LA an area that was full of crime and gangs and all the attendant problems of the hood. But as an experience, you know, it wasn't any different than what millions of kids go through every day. My, um, my grandparents lived in the area because it was close to Little Tokyo. And uh, my family lived with them because we were just getting by. My grandparents were very, they were very old world. My grandfather spoke almost no English. He was, um, well, they were, they were very stern, very formal. Um, my grandfather, they were very traditional too. My grandfather collected samurai swords and my grandmother, she was a calligrapher and she wore these beautiful silk kimonos around the house. And, and they treated me like somebody else's cat. You know what I mean? Sort of like they couldn't really kill me, but they didn't have to be nice to me either. Well, tell me about, I hate to interrupt, but you told no. me a very a hilarious, well, hilarious now in retrospect, anecdote about the swords and your grandfather and you. Oh, dear. My grandfather had a serious collection of samurai swords. Most of them are in the National Museum in Tokyo. And they were seven, 800 years old. And he kept them in this big long drawer wrapped in silk. And collectors would come from all over the world, our little raggedy house to see them. So um, one afternoon, I think I'm 11, and I, uh, uh, I think nobody's home, so I take one out. And there's a very special way to handle them. You know, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a way to even take the sword out of the, out of the sheath. Uh, I didn't know any of this. I took the sword out, I whipped it out. Again, it's seven, 800 years old and I decide to play pirate. So I'm jumping around the living room, swinging this sword, and there was this lamp, this wooden, this wooden lamp, and I, uh, um, I cut it in half. I felled it like a tree. And I'm- But your I'm parents still... love that. Yeah. My, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm worried about the lamp. That's where I am. And, um, and there's my grandfather. You know, he was, he was a very small guy, he was my size, and he was purple, purple with rage. And I remember that he grabbed me and he, he threw me so hard into the screen door that my head and shoulders came out of the other side like a hunting trophy. So we were pretty alienated from each other. Our generations didn't really get along. But they lived in South Central. You lived in South Central. Tell me about your about sort of that neighborhood experience. It was. It's only notable looking back on it. I mean, that was how I, how I grew up. I um, that was my world. I didn't know any other. Um, the majority of people were black, but I was part of the furniture. There wasn't this sort of animosity then between have and have nots. Um, I was just there. And I was a, um, a small kid, a fringe kid. I was nothing much to, to pay attention to. And so I sort of skated through those years. Um, I was always envious of uh, um, my black friends. And they seemed to be so good at so many things and stylish wearing the same hand-me-downs that I was wearing. Um, it was, 
it was for me a, um, a growing up of alienation. Uh, it, it served me in good stead later. It made me a watcher and a listener mm -hmm. and uh, someone who was interested in, in motivations and, and why people did what they did. So how did South Central become East Long Beach? What did you take from your growing up to put into Isaiah's world? It was a more practical consideration. Um, my area of South Central is, is largely Latino, and I wanted to move to a hood that was more diverse. And East Long Beach fits the bill. It's 40 percent white, and I think uh, it's divided up between, between Black, Latino, and, and Asian. And I like that diversity. It just gave me more possibilities for stories and um, different subcultures and cultures as a, um, as background and as a source for stories. Because in, in High Five, there's um, a very big component of the Cambodian community. And East Long Beach, I mean, Long Beach proper has, I think, the biggest Cambodian population outside of um, Cambodia. And that's, uh, yes. and, and, yeah, mm -hmm. and you portray you portray sort of the world and the kind of gang life there. What was the inspiration for, um, for Isaiah? Um, from, originally from Sherlock Holmes. Okay. Um, I was drawn to him. I was drawn to that character. Uh, I thought he was like me in some ways. He was a misfit. He didn't belong. He wasn't a badass. Um, but sort of unlike me, Sherlock had an identity. He was confident. You know, he knew who he was, and he, um, if he faced danger, he could overcome that danger with just his intelligence. And that was important for me, you know, because it meant that there was a way for a kid like me to face this world and, and not be afraid. That was the original, that was the original idea. Um, the, the sort of background of Isaiah, his, his um, milieu is mine, was mine. Mm -hmm. And um, many of the characters are characters I grew up with. Do me a favor. Most uh, most good um, protagonists in crime stories um, have kind of a credo, um, and Isaiah definitely has one. It's on the very very beginning of your brand new book, High Five. Can you read that for us? Sure. I have to go get the book. It's right here. Okay. I would give you mine, but I'm a little farther away than you are. Page one of the prologue. Yeah. Those two graphs. <clears throat> Isaiah Quintabe's East Long Beach neighborhood hadn't changed much over the years. It was the hood when he was growing up, and it was the hood now. Gangs, street crime, poverty, drugs, and violence were constants, facts of life. Isaiah didn't know the statistics, but from his perspective, Things were getting worse. Not surprising viewpoint for when your job was fighting in human suffering and indifference. As the area's only unlicensed PI and unofficial ombudsman, there wasn't much he hadn't seen. Murders, robberies, burglaries, scams, bullying, kidnappings, addiction, rape, child abuse, loan sharking, questionable suicides, runaway children, husbands and wives. There were cases of great consequence, and those of very little, but all were crucial to the victims, whatever the size of the injustice. That is, that is a, a lovely sort of worldview for, for a character. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about your, your, both of your writing processes. Um, Steph, I know you're in the very early stages, the very early stages of your next project. What is, how do you approach a novel and, and what do you kind of tend to do first when you're thinking of one? Oh gosh, early, early stages as in I am sort of thinking about starting a new book. And um, I mean, honestly, like each book, my first three were all in a series. So once I had one down, I kind of knew how to write that sort of novel. I knew how to write a Juniper Song novel. And when I started Your House Will Pay, it was like learning to write all over again. Um, mm -hmm. And it took a long time and it took a lot of figuring out. And I'm kind of at that beginning stage. And I thought I was going to 
um, get really in there before the baby came. I'm, I'm eight months pregnant, but, uh, now I'm just kind of staring at having a hard time focusing on anything. Um, but you no know, kidding. I, usually start, I usually start with character, uh, and setting and see what happens. This time I have some, I, some thematic ideas that I want to work with. Um, you know, I think I do after writing four books that, um, that skirt around Koreatown. I think I might actually want to write a book that deals with Koreatown in a pretty direct way. Um, I think it's a really interesting neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. and I, and, um, but I think, um, I, yeah, I have to, I have to audition some characters. Um, I think, mm -hmm. um, that's something I'm going to be doing over the next month. Um, hopefully <laughs> if, if I can get my act together is yeah, no kidding. kind of figuring out, um, what voices speak to me, what stories speak to me. Um, because right now I just have kind of broad themes that I'm dabbling with. When you write, what is, what is the circumstance? Do you, are you a coffee shop writer? Are you a in the closet with absolutely no sound writer? What are your, what is your writing place? I'm right here, like in this spot with these dogs on either side of me, usually. Um, I'm not a coffee shop writer. I think uh, I, I I actually like you know coronavirus sheltering mode is actually my ideal uh, uh, writing circumstances. Um, unfortunately, the anxiety and uh, existential pressures um, are not usually a part of that, and so it makes right. it a little hard. <laughs> but but um, I am usually home all day, um, you know, in my pajamas, brushing my teeth very late in the day. Uh, and I kind of have to force structure on myself um, and kind of force myself to sit down for like half hour increments and kind of get solid writing done. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely a work at home person. And Joe, I think when we talked about this, it sounds to me like you write like a monk. Talk about Pretty your much. writing process. Yeah. Tell me about the room and what you do to prepare. I lock myself in my study. I close the windows, I shut the door. Um, it's soundproof, but I wear earplugs just to get that complete isolation um, where I'm where I'm in the scene. I'm there physically, I can see it, I can talk to the characters. My process is very different from Steph's. She starts out with ideas and themes, things she wants to write about. Um, and she does with great, with great insight. Um, I start with some characters and a story idea, and then I just write. If I hit a theme, it's inadvertent. And I'll write, um, I'll write about 100 pages, and then um, I'll see what I have. If I get 200 pages, I can sort of see where the story could go, what other subplots I could write in, what characters I need, and then I look back on what I've written, and I start to see where um, maybe I broke a thread. You know, I wrote something on page 26, but I didn't carry it through on page 100. Or there's something in the early pages that I don't need. Or um, there's, um, there is a theme I want to follow through on. And I go back and forth. I write, and then I look back, and I write, and I look back. It's very inefficient. I wouldn't commend it to anybody, but that's the way, I've, that's the way I write now. Um Steph, you brought up the question of social distancing and the whole kind of idea of the coronavirus being, you know, which is all of our strange experience right now, being good for um, the the writing process. Can you talk a little bit about social distance and the novelist? I mean, I think... Uh... I think social distance is um, outside of this particular mandatory experience can be good for the novelist. I think it's terrible for, I, I, it's terrible for a uh, creative energy right now. I think just yeah. because um, there's so much trash going through everyone's brains that the days just go by and nobody feels productive, or at least that's how I feel. Um, you know, I know there are the Shakespeare's out there who are certainly making amazing art, but I'm not one of them. I think in general, um, you know, writing novels, um, having that social distance can be can be a great thing. Although I really like being able to go to lunch or, um, you know, not worry about uh, people I know dying when I'm trying to write something. 
Um, no kidding. Yeah, but being but being by yourself and being like forced to sit down and um, reckon with a blank page is generally a good strategy for um, for um, generating ideas and uh, you know because I do think that a lot of writing um, fiction or any kind of creative work um, more of it at least for me is is work than pure inspiration or whatever I think like having that um, having that need and the uh, discipline to kind of sit down in a chair and like write stuff without distraction is um, is extremely valuable um, it's not yeah that's not it, it, it's it's a weird time to be uh, a writer right now I think and I think a lot of people are feeling the same way which is that yeah. we are currently in the situation where like you know, maybe we'll all look back with great regret at the at the writing that we did not do during this period that should have been um, very productive. But um, I think by then we probably will have forgotten what it's actually like to be living yeah. through this. I think it's a weird time for everybody doing anything, even waking up in the morning. Joe, you are a social distance, socially distant human being in the course of your life, yes? I am self-quarantined by nature. Um, <laughs> It is really my retreat from mm -hmm. from all the craziness. I am I can bury myself in what I'm writing, and that's that's the best part for me. When I'm not sitting on my shoulder, when I'm not thinking about anything else, um, when I am in the story, I'm part of the story. Uh, that's that's the best part of it. That's the that's the best thing um, about writing for me. Um, I can I can totally separate myself uh, from the outside world. It's a problem when I come back into the outside world. I am um, frequently dazed and confused, and um, I am not used to this sort of constant low-level sense of threat. Uh, that is very distracting, but it, it just sends me right back in my study to write some more. So uh, the, one of the things I've noticed in all of the books I've read, um, most of the, the heroes and heroines are solitary people. They are um, they are loners. They feel apart from the. They feel oftentimes like they don't fit in. Can is that something that is an issue for Isaiah? Yes, he's he's um he's been he's been by himself. Um, he has no social skills to speak of. Um, he felt very guilty about things that happened in his past and has, um, and has lived his life in a very solitary way. Um, that, is, that is something like me. There's, very, there's a lot of them in, in myself, um, that feeling of not belonging, that feeling of I'm not like anybody else. And it's, it's interesting to write his vulnerabilities and to use my own experience. It's, um, it's, it's revelatory sometimes about myself, about how I grew up, about Does what... it make you feel vulnerable? Does it make you feel vulnerable? No, it makes me feel less vulnerable. Really, why? I'm not as, I'm not as dependent on what people think or what people feel or um, what the atmosphere is. It does not affect me as much. I am an observer. I am a watcher. And what people are doing around me, I think, affects me less than most. Interesting. Steph, what about Juniper Song? I mean, you wrote this really cool trilogy um, of, of um, a character that you wanted to see in fiction, but didn't. So tell me, is she a loner? Is she someone who feels separate from the world and not quite fitting in also? You know, she is a loner and she starts out, um, she starts out that way and her, you know, the first book, her world is very small and then it gets even right. narrower before it starts expanding again. Um, you know, initially I was interested in writing a character who was like a Philip Marlowe. You know, I thought um, something that appealed to me about Marlowe is that he's this man w who you know very little about except what you see him do. Um, he mm -hmm. has very little past that comes up. Like, you hear little 
bits of his history, but like you don't really get to know where he came from, his family, all that. Um, and in initial drafts of uh, Follow Our Home, Juniper Song was very much like that too. Um, and then I realized, um, you know, I got feedback on this. I talked to my agent about it, and then I got the same feedback from enough people that I ended up kind of giving her more of a uh, personal history. And I think that is more essential, especially when you're dealing with an amateur sleuth. Um, but I, w I had to situate her more in, um, in a family, in a social group. Um, but she said, but I wanted her to have that kind of Philip Marlowe quality, um, where she has that kind of, um, you know, good, the, um, the down this down those mean streets uh, a man must walk you know the kind of mm -hmm. idealistic uh kind of crusader type i wanted to give her a little bit of that while also making her you know a 27 year old uh millennial um in L in present day la does she what would you say her her credo is there's a there was a section in one of the novels maybe the third one um, she where she talked, yeah, tell me, tell me, yes, and, and, uh, Duke or Milo, out of the way. Yeah, Milo, come on, this is, <laughs> um, you know, I think she tries to follow, uh, she has, she has a strong moral compass, um, and she tries to follow it, but I think it is led up by, um, the desire to protect the people that she cares about, um, and I think she is pretty open about prioritizing those people over other people. Um, I think she, um, you know, she cares about justice being carried out. Um, she cares about keeping the people around her safe. Um, she can also be pretty ruthless, um, you know, when, when people do not conform to, um, to her ideas of, uh, of, um, the way that you're supposed to be in the world and the, and the, and, um, I think loyalty is kind of foremost with her, um, and, I, and that kind of carries her through um, in her personal relationships and the way she approaches crime, too. Joe, excuse me. Joe, when, talk a little bit about your previous life and how you got into the whole writing novels that are so well-received. I was a, um, a screenwriter before, um, before I wrote, wrote IQ. And um, I worked a fair bit. I worked for most of the majors. And uh, I was doing pretty well. But nothing I made, nothing I wrote, got made. Mm, one after the other. You know, there was some Hollywood reason why it just fell out of development. <clears throat> development. And, in, and as a screenwriter, you keep score by, by, um, by what, you, what you've had made. And uh, time after time, nothing got made. I got incredibly frustrated. And just quit. Um, nobody noticed, but I quit, and I moped around for a long time. I was um, uh, I was feeling sorry for myself. I was depressed, and uh, I finally realized that I had to uh, had to make a living, and um, my only practical skill was writing. So I thought writing a novel was a pretty good idea. Steph, you were your beginning with uh, Juniper's song was a little bit different. How old were you when you decided to write her? Um, I was in law school, so when I started writing that first book, I was twenty-two. Um, which um, you know, I think uh, a lot of novelists start at um, at that age, but they're usually doing MFAs. Um, I think people who write crime fiction often come to it as like a second career. It wasn't really a second career for me. I was a student, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually always impressed with people who are able to write, um, write novels when they have full-time jobs. Um, you know, when you're a student and you decide that you don't really care what your grades are anymore, you can kind of do what you want. Um, and so that's, uh, I wrote my first book when I was in law school. And did you care about your grades at the time? Um, we didn't really have grades, so that was oh, that was nice. Perfect. That was a, that was a luxury. <laughs> no kidding, no kidding. So I want to ask both of you: Who are we? I think we have both talked about um, some of the the changing uh, noir hero in Los Angeles through the years. Steph, talk about a few of the ones that you like and um, and what what they came out of. Oh, um, you know, just across across the whole history of L.A. Noir. 
Um, yeah. I, I mean, uh, well, more well, modern because you you were you're, okay. Yeah. The the ones that I really like now. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I love I love the works of uh, Naomi Hirahara and Rachel Hazelhall. Um, they write these amazing characters who um, who live and work in contemporary Los Angeles, and they kind of take you to places that um, that you just don't typically see in in other books. Um, you know, I love Michael Connelly too. I think uh, I think he's a fantastic writer who um, who uh, who brings something to um, even like the police procedural that I think is unique and kind of nuanced and complicated. But I, but I but I really like. Um, Naomi's and Rachel's books, um, just off the top of my head for um, contemporary stuff. Um, and I know that, uh, like, Rachel has a new book coming out in, um, well, who knows, who knows what publishing schedules are. Yeah, exactly. Like right now, but she's, I think she exactly. supposedly has exactly. a new one coming out um, later this year that is, um, that is a uh, PI novel, and that's a switch from her series, which has been, oh. uh, which has been a police series. Uh, I'm not sure I'm happy about that because I just finished her fourth one. I read all four in the process of writing this story that I that's in the paper today, and I just finished the last one. It's right here. It's holding up my computer. It's City of Saviors, um, and I I really want to have her character back. I miss that character. Uh, I hope she comes back too. But um, I think I, I mean I'm always I'm always interested in uh, PI fiction. I think. Uh, P, the PI character is one that um, offers a certain kind of flexibility that I've always enjoyed, and um, sure. it's been interesting to see kind of the switch from police procedural to PI fiction um, from the same author. Um, and I think I think you'll really like her new book also. There's a, a woman named I think it's I'm going to butcher her name Catherine Forrest. She wrote Kate Delafield was her her character. It was a um, a lesbian LAPD. Um, uh, detective, and she came about in the 80s, right when the lawsuits were being settled that women could kind of rise in the LAPD. And there's a whole lot of um, kind of sexual harassment, et cetera, et cetera, um, and inability to like believe in women's skills. Um, and that's in Rachel's current books too. Are you surprised that in the you know the what 30 odd years that women who are being represented uh, in the LAPD the ranks of the LAPD are still dealing with that stuff. No, that's surprising. Um, I think I think you see that in every industry that uh, that um, no matter how much progress women make, um, it's still astonishing the uh, the kind of BS that they have to deal with on the individual level and on the on and on the population level. I mean, we see it. Uh, you know, we see it playing out in politics. We see it play, playing out in in like every field, um, so it doesn't particularly surprise me. And especially with with police, I mean that's such a that's such a male dominated um, right. that's such a male dominated profession. I'm not surprised that it's um, pretty stubborn to change. So, Joe, who do you like in terms of either you know, uh, in addition to Sherlock Holmes, who do you read? Who do you read as far as um, crime fiction goes? I can I can tell you who I've been reading. Mm -hmm. um, Ivy Pachota, Wonder Valley, and J. Todd Scott, um, The Far Empty, um, My Absolute Darling, Gabriel Talent, um, The Mars Room. I can't remember who wrote it, but um, I've stayed sort of within the, the crime genre, but I haven't read a lot of strictly what you call noir. I don't think I've read any of those authors, which surprises the heck out of me. Tell me a little bit about them. The favorite one my absolute, of those three. My Absolute Darling um, by um, great Gabriel Talon is one of the scariest books I have ever read. It's extremely oh. dark. It's incredibly oh. well written. Um, but that's a book that keeps me up nights. Oh, it's, great. Um, it, it, it's very hard to describe, but it's a terrific book. Um, Wonder Valley, Ivy Pachota is, maybe that is more, it's a classic L.A. novel. Mm -hmm. A lot of it takes place in the desert. It's about people who've come to this place called Wonder Valley looking for their dreams and don't find them. Um, she also is a wonderful, wonderful writer. Um, is, there, is, there, is there a book you wish you had written? Oh, many. Um, yeah, like what? 
Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. I wish I'd written that. Um, it's one of the few books I reread over and over again because of Le Carre's writing. It's so precise. It's so um, detailed and yet human. And he can write five pages about an old man walking up a flight of stairs, and it's riveting. He, um, his sense of story is so vast and encompassing, and um, there are such broad themes of you know, geopolitics and, and um, espionage and all those things. Um, I really love his books. I, I think I've read all of them more than once. Hmm. Jeff, you, is there um, a book you wish? Oh, go on. Oh, I was going to ask both of you if you had read Ivy Picotta's new book, These Women. Uh, it's coming out next month, and I just read it. It's, it's amazing. Joe, I think you'll really enjoy it. I think you both will. Um, but it's This is Ivy Picotta? Yeah, she has a new book coming out in May, and uh, we should all support her because it's a hell of a time to have a new book out. Um, it's it's a and this is even more of an LA novel than Wonder Valley. Um, it takes place kind of up and down Western Avenue. It's based loosely on the Grim Sleeper case, but it's about these women, like the way that people might say um, in a condescending way about women who uh, who are on street corners, who are in who are sex workers, who are drug addicted. Um, and, um, it's, it's just a fantastic LA book. Um, and she's, she's an amazing writer and, um, uh, I, I, I'd highly recommend this one. Um, I think anyone watching this would be really into this book. Is there a book that I you read her? Um, oh, sorry. Ask. No, no, no. Continue. I just, I can't remember the, the, the title of her last one, but it was about a woman who decides she wants to spend her life sleeping. It's, it's hilarious. And it's, it's a lot about what we need and don't need in our lives. But I like the last one, too. I'll, I'll, I'll read the next one, too. Steph, is there a book you wish you'd written? Mm, yeah, lots of them. I mean, there, there's so, every Ooh. time I read a book that is a, that, that, uh, that kind of um, impresses me, I wish I would have written it. And, um, and I know I couldn't have. But uh, recently, I've been really into uh, Sarah Gran. Um, who writes the Claire DeWitt series. I think those books are pretty incredible, um, but I, it, they're not the kind of books that I could write. Why not? Um, they're, they're really existential and strange in a way that I think if I tried to do that, it would feel um, pretentious and kind of out of my range. Uh, you know, I kind of tend to write really realistic, kind of on the ground stuff, and um, and I appreciate the, her way of dealing with the genre. Um, it's just very different from mine, and she's she's uh, again, she's just a fantastic writer. Um, so, Joe, what is your what is tell us a little bit about the next um, sort of some of the next uh, steps with IQ? There's a TV series in the works. There is. Um, the uh, producers have put together what they call a package, um, a showrunner named uh, Matt Carnahan, um, highly set up a guy, uh, a director named Dion Taylor, excellent director. Uh, and um, the producers, uh, Elkhorn and Atlas, are uh, longtime veteran movie makers, and my books. And they're taking that package and shopping it to the networks. Um, they're doing that now. Um, it's taking longer because of the, the situation, but that's that what you think. That thing. So, yeah. Yeah, that thing. Um, so de you were not the screenwriter on this. No, no, I, um, I'm, I'm mostly done with screenwriting. There may be something that comes up I want to write, but, but, um, the process is very difficult. Process involves a lot of other people, and um, a lot of people have something to say about the development of a, of a pilot. And I, um, I'm really spoiled now. I get to write it, what I want to write. Is it true to your books? The pilot is the pilot. Uh, then Matt wrote is is terrific. Um, mm -hmm. I was really really happy with it. Yeah, it is true to the books. Who and would that you whole want team. To let I'm sorry, go on. Sorry. And the whole 
question is? Um, uh, uh, the pilot is just is just terrific. It, it really is the books, and they, they have a great deal of respect for the material, and it's been a terrific um, uh, relationship. Who would you want to play Isaiah? A young Denzel. Um, I think he I, has. I don't know who that is. I was going to say, I don't think that's quite possible right now. <laughs> <laughs> Turn Probably back the not. clock a little while. Hologram. Yeah, exactly. But that's exactly that's who I had in my head. That's who I had in my head. He has that intensity and that obvious intelligence. And um, so all he has to be is 25 years old. Oh, well, we'll, we'll work on that. Um, <laughs> so tell me about the next Isaiah book. Um, you said you're going to be taking him out of Long Beach. He, um, at the end of High Five, lots of people are after him. So he flees. He flees Long Beach. Uh, he has to leave his, um, his true love, Grace, behind. And he is sick of crime and criminals and death and suffering. And he decides he doesn't want to be IQ anymore. And he, um, he travels sort of meandering. He ends up in a very small town. And this will be his, his place where he will rest, sanctuary. And of course, that isn't what happens. Um, he gets involved in in a very um, dangerous, awful, horrifying crime. And crime. Dotson has his own story. One L. Dotson, he's the ex-hustler. Right. And his wife is is demanding that he get a steady job. And um, he's too cool to get a steady job. So his wife demands that he become an intern at an advertising agency. And, oh no. Um, so, I, yes. I don't think I can. I, I don't think I can see that happening. <laughs> At least not so, happening well. Dotson is thrown into this into this world of uh -huh. nine to five and white collar workers and and um, creating ads. And uh -huh. those are the two main stories. Um, can I read this tomorrow? I mean, are you ready? Because I'm ready to read another IQ novel. <laughs> You'll have to wait a little bit. I'm editing. Darn. So. Okay, well, speed it up, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm in a hurry to read another one. So It's okay. quarantine you're... fiction. Yeah, I've no been kidding. Enjoying, I've been enjoying the hell out of a high five. I was so happy to have another IQ novel to read. No kidding. Thank you, Steph. So, but you're... Steph, you're not going to do another Juniper song, you said. Not in the immediate future. Um, I kind of want to give her a rest. Uh, she's been through a lot, but also I'm interested in... Um, you know, I kind of did a little pivot going into your house will pay into this kind yeah. of subgenre of crime fiction that I think of as like social crime fiction. It's kind of m less about the mystery side of things and more about using crime as a way to to um, examine community and society. Um, and so I kind of want to live in that in that side of things for a while, at least for another book or two, and then we'll see how things go. But um, for now, I'm not going back to soft. Um, I, I feel like I want to give her, if I go back to her, I want to give her some time off. Um, for one thing, you know, PIs don't actually usually run into murder after murder. Um, I feel yeah. like she would be um, some kind of internet celebrity by now if she were real. So I'll give her a rest. Do you, so do you foresee the, the next several books to be standalone books? I think so. I don't know. I can only... I can barely think one book at a time right now, but uh, I think the next one, certainly. Um, and you, and, have, uh, you, have, you have another project going on, too, like April 29th? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I, have a, I have a baby coming um, uh, in, I guess, uh, yeah, I'm due in less than a month now, um, due the anniversary of the LA uprising. <laughs> and, oh, lovely. Uh, and I'm likely to be delivering in um, these conditions. So we'll see how things go. <laughs> how are you doing with all of that? This is a very uh, strange know, time to be anything, let alone pregnant. You know, I've had a really easy pregnancy so far to the point where, you know, I, I don't know, I felt like the other shoe had dropped. <laughs> I, I didn't even have morning sickness. Um, you know, and I've, I've, I've really enjoyed being pregnant for the most part, which is not something that I was expecting. 
Um, and so this is just kind of a wrinkle. Um, I think that as long as I can get through the birth part without anybody getting infected, um, I'll be fine. <laughs> that's the, that's the main thing that worries me. Um, but then, yeah. um, once, once the baby comes, you know, we would have to be, we would be self-isolating anyway, right? It's not like we're going to be going out and doing fun things. We'll just be home right. alone with the baby. Um, so, you know, two birds, one stone, I guess. But. Yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll cover it. So you were talking about the, the other next project being about Koreatown and maybe about sort of issues of gentrification and things like that. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm interested in, um, in the way that uh, property ownership has um, defined, um, has just, def has drawn all the lines really in, uh, in society for going back to the beginning of American history, right? Um, uh, the, the idea of land ownership, of owning people, of, uh, of um, you know, manifest destiny, all these kind of American ideas that uh, involve taking from other people and appropriating and making something yours. Um, I, it, you know, um, I, re I, I read Attica Locke's Highway 59 books, which are amazing. And the second I book love her pretty heavily. Oh, she's so good. And actually two yeah. of her books that I've read deal pretty heavily with, um, with land, land ownership. Mm -hmm. And I think it sounds, it's something that like sounds dry when you kind of think of it in an abstract, but that is so definitive of the way that people live their lives and who, um, and like what your grandparents owned, um, is so definitive of that, the way that you live your life. And it becomes, and it oh, makes God. everything political so personal that I think it's just something that I've kind of wanted to grapple with. And, you know, I live, I live adjacent to Koreatown. I live like in uh, Windsor Square, which is between Hancock Park and Koreatown in, um, so I'm in like a, a neighborhood with a lot of single family homes next to a neighborhood that's mostly apartments and renters. Um, and I think it's kind of an interesting place to look at, um, look at crime and look at that, the kind of hard dividing lines between people who have property and people who don't and uh, the way that the way the, the collisions that happen there. And I think especially in this age where every, where people are on next door and people are hyper aware of, um, of, whatever crimes are happening in their neighborhood, you know, and, and, the and who ring. doesn't belong and who doesn't belong yeah, there and exactly. pointing them out. And yeah, the other, there's so much about the other in, in next door. Yeah. And I, and I think that it's something that becomes so personal for people. people nobody, people are so defensive about their property, about, um, you know, it's something that brings out the uh, deep conservative side of people who would consider themselves progressive. Um, and so I'm kind of interested in exploring that um, through the lens of kind of this neighborhood. And but, but one of the things that we talked about briefly was that um, you don't quite know what the issues will be when we're on the other side of this. What does that do? What does that uncertainty do to your process? Um, well, it gives me a convenient excuse not to work. Uh, that's definitely thank you coronavirus <laughs> <laughs> but I mean I, I I do think something that has become really apparent in all this is that we need to rethink the way that um, we define safety nets and what is an acceptable minimum for the way that people live um, I think that we ha are being forced to consider what the value of labor is um, to be forced to consider, you know, the, the, um, actually the LA Times had a great article about this, about, uh, kind of the collision of homelessness and the coronavirus, um, and the way those things, those things interact, you know, that was, homelessness was, um, was and still is one of the biggest issues facing LA. Um, and I think that the, in the aftermath of this crisis, we're going to have to address homelessness in a way that is radically different or um, more proactive than the way we've been dealing with it in the past, um, because it's just obvious how um, how insufficient um, our our approach to the the our kind of in incremental approaches to these like huge societal problems has been. Um, you know, so there's reason to be optimistic. There's reason to be pessimistic. You know, these things don't change that rapidly. But um, I think that um, 
we are being forced to reckon with these things because of the way that um, coronavirus has hit our city. I mean, it's an international, global thing too. But um, I, I, but I, I can see it changing a lot of the the way that we talk about the issues facing LA. Um, Joe, you had said that uh, when we talked that um, your first books were why done it, and this uh, high five is the first who done it. Talk, can you talk a little bit about that and tell us what the next um, Isaiah book is going to be, a why or a who? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm much more interested in character than anything else. Um, I like to write about why people do things. I like to write about how they come to that brink, how they're, what brought them to this place where they're willing to do things that are so extreme. And I like to write about personal change. Um, I thought from the start that I wanted the characters in my books to evolve like people do and to face different life changes as they grew older and their circumstances circumstances change. And <clears throat> and that's why I call it the, the first two books, at least. Um, why I done it? And um, I, I, I always thought that mystery was the weakest part of my game. So I wanted to write. Um, a real whodunit, and um, I, uh, I got the idea for High Five, and I thought that was a good place to. That was a, that was a good that was a good idea to start with. Um, it was very complicated to write. I got lost. I can imagine. <laughs> I got lost it's any so number of times. So many characters and so much so much you know complexity. I I got lost in my own mystery. I had no idea where I was or what I was doing. And I turned it in early to my editor, Josh. It doesn't Campbell. show, by the way. I'm glad, but he's he, he he's a terrific help. He was a terrific help. You know, I turned it in in 87,000 words, ended up being 113,000 words. Um, so we did Lucky we did a us. lot Lucky of readers. Work. Um, and so that was that was my objective to write a real mystery. Um, the the new book. The new book is more um, thriller. It's more thriller and fun. I'd say it's it's sort of evenly divided. Dodson's story, uh, I hope, is um, is funny, um, and um, funny but intense. And Isaiah's story is is pure thriller. Um, so this is going to be my last question, and then we'll go to readers. Here's one that was actually we're good, that was my last question. We're going to go we're going to go to a reader question that was submitted in advance, and this was one um, that uh, let me see if I can find it here. It was submitted by a reader named Jim Crossley, and he said, "Hi, this question is for both authors. My students are seniors in high school and may be tuning in online. I hope they did. Hello, if they did." Um, and have read Chandler's Red Wind and watched L.A. Confidential and are, are now reading Kem Nunn's Tijuana Straits. How do you see your novels fitting into the traditions of Southern California noir? Who wants to go first? Steph, go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that uh, my noir is very contemporary, so it's very 2010. Ooh, I guess... Yeah, it's 2010s. I don't have one in the 2020s yet. Um, but it's very contemporary. It brings in um, kind of a millennial point of view. Um, and I think that it brings in like um, a world that feel, I don't know, when I set out to write those books, um, all of my books, I kind of wanted to write in a way that was natural, not at all kind of forced or super intentional about it, that reflected um, the communities that I that I grew up with, you know, kind of my eclectic group of friends, um, you know, Korean Americans in LA, you know, which is a massive community. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think it's, I think uh, my fiction is just a reflection of the way that um, I experience LA and, um, and that's just a little bit different from the way that others have in the past. I mean, in part because it's just very contemporary. Joe, what about you? 
How does uh, how do your well, books think, fit into the Southern California noir? I think that they are they're still conventional in the sense that it's about one guy and um, seeking justice uh, in a very dangerous city. Um, but I think um, my, the IQ books are much more diverse. They cover um, different parts of society that you, would, you wouldn't necessarily see. And um, they are contemporary. Um, mostly what I try to write is a fun, exciting book that's somewhere in the zeitgeist. And um, uh, I hope young people enjoy them. Uh, Again, I, I, when I write a theme or um, when I find a theme, it is as I'm writing. I'm not as intentional as, as, um, as Steph. You know, Steph writes what I would call necessary books. You know, we need to read them. You know, mine are recreational. Um, mm. And hopefully they do a good job of that. Very good. A very good job. I uh, I wish I had been at a point where I hadn't read any of your books so I could enjoy them for the first time again. They're really all of them are incredibly lovely. I've read I read High Five for this for this um, story and this project, and I read all of yours um, for this whole thing. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I think that's very lovely. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful. I'm glad. And I think Donna. Is yes, this a Donna we have time? some more. We have some more reader questions coming in while you guys have been talking, um, and throughout the day we've had a few questions, uh, some of which you've already answered in your conversation. Um, but this one comes from Sandy Irons, and she brings it in on YouTube, and it's for Joe. She said, "What's with the statue in the background? Tell us about it." <laughs> oh. Um Uh, this is one of the, the most terrific presents I ever got, ever. Uh, it was given to is. me by the by the ladies turning ladies of color turning pages book club, and um, we had a luncheon together, and um, we had a terrific time. Um, there were about a dozen of us, fifteen of us, in a Jamaican restaurant. It was all laughs and fun, and um, they really liked the books. And they gave me this. It was touching then, and it's touching now. That's IQ, right? That's IQ. And he's wearing what he wore in the, in the book. Yeah. Light blue shirt. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, and and Timberlands. And, well, I... and you put them in high five. I, you put uh, the yeah, book club I in did. high five. <laughs> okay. I do. Right. Can, I I see the, can, I see can I see the little Timberlands? Uh... Oh, there they are. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Sure. Uh, so this one is for Steph. Um, John Topp uh, has a question. He says he's a great big fan of Raymond Chandler, his writing and defining the whole genre of noir. But but he thinks over time um, that um, Chandler and his uh, main character haven't aged so well and that he sees um, concerns about misogyny and racism. And he wants uh, to know if, if Seth, if you have some concerns, if you have any ambivalent feelings um, um, about Chandler and your thoughts given your protagonist, uh, Juniper Sun. Yeah, actually, the, um, the fact that I love Chandler so much while also recognizing that um, his books were kind of misogynist and racist, um, those together are probably why I started writing in the genre in the first place. Um, because I had such a strong reaction to his books, both of deep love and recognition and of understanding that this is not the LA that I know, that I wanted to kind of open up a conversation with him. And so when I thought I wanted to write a novel, that's kind of what I went to. I always thought, even before I, even before, well before I started writing Follow Our Home, I thought I would love to read a book that took kind of the Raymond Chandler approach to writing about the Korean American LA community. Um, and so when I decided to kind of try to write something on my own, that's what I went to. And I wanted to kind of talk to this guy who is the defining scribe of LA, um, and really kind of update the books, you know, 
they're very much a product of their time, um, you know, and I know we use that as an excuse for, to let a lot of um, a lot a lot of old uh, or rather dead white men off the hook. But, you know, he is a dead white man um, who wrote some amazing novels that had some uh, some turns of phrase that um, kind of make your stomach churn. Uh, Great, thank you. Um, I have another question that came in from Dennis Nosen, and he lives in San Pedro. He says he particularly, uh, this is for Joe, he grew up in Long Beach. He works, uh, spent his career working at Long Beach Memorial Hospital. His son went to Long Beach Poly High. So he really appreciates the settings of your novels. Um, he specifically mentioned that he enjoyed Wrecked and High Five. And his question is, as I read through the action scenes and dialogue, I pictured a graphic novel. Have you ever thought about um, turning IQ into a graphic novel? I have not, but I will. I'll start thinking about it now. I think there are there are some things that would lend themselves to a graphic novel, but um, no, I I haven't thought about it. I have um, I have a tough enough time writing them. So. <laughs> and one more for you, Joe. This is a reader came in on Twitter um, who read Righteous and quite enjoyed it, um, but he says. Why no Japanese American lead characters in your book? What's going on? I grew up in a neighborhood that was um, uh, uh, largely black, and the vast majority of my friends were black, and so my connections are with them. You know, I had I had very little um, connection to my own cultural heritage. I was, um, me and my brothers were completely alienated. You know, we'd adapted to the neighborhood. Um, you know, our friends were black, so we co-opted their speech style, musical tastes. And um, being Japanese, it, it, it didn't occur to me. It, it, it wasn't um, a description that I would, I would use on myself for a very long time. And so my, um, my emotional connections growing up were not with Japanese people. The only Japanese people I really knew were in my family, and I was alienated from them. So um, that's why. That's why. Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank all three of you for just a fascinating and amazing conversation. Um, thank you for helping us jumpstart the book club. We were, we were really sad when we had to shut down live events. And we thought, let's see if we can make it go virtual. And um, this is amazing. So thank you, all three of you. I want to um, thank yeah. our readers uh, for joining us and mention that um, if you want to know more about upcoming book club events, go to latimes.com backslash book club. And that is our book club uh, sign up page, our newsletter, and we will keep you in the loop. Um, we also always have a survey. If you've been to our book club events, you know we always ask you. Um, tell us what we can do better and what we should read next. So uh, we have a survey, and if you'd like to uh, fill it out, um, this is just the start of us um, doing virtual book clubs. Um, and I think we're off to a great start. Uh, before we end, I'd like to circle back to our amazing uh, guests. And um, I always like to give our writers the last word. Uh, Steph, anything you'd like to add this evening? Parting uh, thoughts? I just want to I just want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, this uh, it, It's nice to be here, by which I mean your living rooms in addition to my living room, which is um, I've been in constantly for the last two weeks. Um, so, and this has been really wonderful, just talking to people. And, you know, uh, it, it's been a privilege for me too, because I'm reading Joe's books. I, I've read all of his books and, uh, and it's just, it's great to kind of have this conversation. Joe, final thoughts? It is, it's been a terrific experience being, having a, a, a connection with, with readers and with Steph. I've never had an extended conversation with Steph and um, I've always wanted to. And it's, it's good to connect to her and to get some insight into her books. And um, I hope this, I hope this, this kind of experience with other writers will, will really catch on. And, and I think it will. Maria, parting words? I just want to say thank you. Stay safe, stay home. And when you're home, read Steph and Joe's books. They're wonderful. You will not regret a moment you spend.
Well, my parting words are thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for letting the LA Times Book Club continue. We're just getting started. We're heading up on our first anniversary. And um, I look forward to many more wonderful events. Uh, thank you, everyone, and good night. Good night. Good night.